Hello and welcome to Eiffel Science. Today we're going to be discussing three unusual topics that relate to the everyday phenomenon of being a human being. First up is, well, there's no pretty way of saying it, butt hair. Yep, it's something that we all deal with to varying degrees, but what purpose does it serve? Whilst the hair on our heads, in our armpits, and around our nether regions serve a number of obvious functions, scientists still don't have a definitive explanation for our backsides. One theory suggests that we have butt hair for no reason other than that there's no evolutionary pressure against it. In other words, the presence of hair around the anus doesn't appear to impede our chances of passing on our genes. And having less fuzz on one's bum doesn't, therefore, bring any reproductive advantages. This is good news for anyone who may be a little embarrassed about their hairy bottoms, as it brings home the fact that over the course of our evolution, butt hair has never acted as a barrier to mating success. Another possible explanation for our posterior moustache states that hair may help to amplify our anal scent. Whilst most modern humans probably don't aspire to this, it's likely that early hominins used a sense as an important means of communication, and as such the capacity to broadcast one's odour over long distances would have conveyed a number of advantages, allowing our ancient ancestors to mark their territory and attract mates. Hair helps with this because it traps oily secretions that carry scent, while also providing an environment for bacteria which consume these oils and generate more smells. A third and final theory states that butt hair serves to reduce friction and chafing as we move around. By trapping the aforementioned oils, hairs ensure that our cracks remain nicely lubricated, thereby protecting us from irritation and rashes. So there's no need to despair. And now Eleanor is going to talk to you about another unsightly human experience, earwax. Thanks Chris. Yes, earwax is next up on the agenda, but more importantly why you shouldn't be trying to remove it yourself. Earwax might look gross, but that doesn't mean it isn't good for you. In fact, it plays an important role in our ear canals. Unfortunately, however, the norm is for us to try and get rid of it, and many people are making their health worse by overcleaning their canals with unsafe tools. So put that cotton bud down and listen up. Earwax is a natural secretion that comes from a combination of glands and the skin cells that line the ear canal. It's known as cerebrum, and you'll find it in every person's ear regardless of their hygiene regimen. The orangey-brown goop keeps the skin of the ear canal soft and healthy while also forming a protective acidic layer. This kills potentially harmful pathogens like bacteria and fungi, contributing to an environment that's healthy and infection-free. Earwax is a combination of benign ingredients including oil, sweat, dead skin cells and the occasional dust particle, but it can cause problems. Too much can lead to an impaction, causing hearing problems. But ironically, the steps that people take to get rid of earwax can make this worse. Impaction is more common in people with narrow ear canals that use things like noise cancelling earphones, hearing aids or cotton buds. The body naturally clears earwax, shedding scales that shift it gradually closer to the exterior of the ear until either it falls away or gets swept up during normal washing. When you charge in with a cotton bud, you force the gradual conveyor belt of earwax and dead skin cells back into the ear canal where it's more likely to build up and cause problems. So that begs the question, do you need to clean your ears? It's important to remember that earwax is natural and helpful to the body. You do not need to have to do anything unless you have earwax buildup that causes symptoms or prevents your health care provider from examining your ears. Ironically, a lot of cotton bud brands mention the fact that they're not suitable for ear cleaning on the packaging, but we humans do love to ignore safety warnings. Beyond encouraging impaction, there's a risk you could push it a little too far and damage the eardrum. Symptoms like itchiness, fullness and muffled hearing, fluid or pain in the ears are worth checking out with your healthcare provider. So when it comes to ear cleaning, it seems like less is more, thanks to good old earwax. Back to you, Chris. Thanks, Elle. For our final topic, we're going to be discussing exactly what it is that makes us cry. So why do we cry? Humans are the only animals known to cry as a form of emotional release. We cry when we're sad, but we also cry when we're happy and when we're angry. Why is this? There are three different types of tears. The first, Basal tears are produced by the tear ducts on a near constant basis. These exist to lubricate, nourish, clean and protect the cornea, basically to keep the eye healthy. You can think of them as being like a shield that protects your eye from the dirt of the outside world. The second are reflex tears, which instinctively appear when our eyes are irritated. Whether that irritation is caused by smoke particles or a fallen eyelash or something else. Not only do these tears help wash away the thing causing the irritation, but they also contain extra antibodies to kill any bacteria that may be contaminating the eye. The third and final type are emotional tears, which are triggered by exceptionally strong feelings. Experts aren't exactly sure why humans have evolved to express our emotions with tears. However, there are a few potential explanations. One popular theory is that emotional tears are a form of non-verbal communication. A baby, for example, can evoke a strong and immediate reaction from its parents when it cries. 
In adulthood, it might be a way of openly displaying feelings of vulnerability or joy to build connections with friends, family and acquaintances. Or alternatively, spark an empathic response from those around you while you're emotionally or physically in trouble. Even our pets can understand the strong social signals of crying. Another reason could be that welling up offers some kind of release for physical and emotional pain. All tears constitute some mix of water, salt, oil, and germ-killing enzymes, but those that stream down our faces when we're emotional or in pain contain higher levels of various stress hormones and feel-good chemicals, including one called leucine enkephalin, which is an endorphin and natural painkiller. This pleasing combination of oxytocin and endorphins could explain the concept of a good cry. But while the cause of emotional tears is still a conundrum, the mechanism behind them is much better understood. All tears are produced by the lacrimal glands found above each eye. With basal tears, blinking causes the liquid to spread across the surface of the eye. Leftover tears then drain through the puncta, which are the holes in the corners of the upper and lower eyelids, through the canaliculus and down the tear duct, where they empty through your nostrils. However, when we're upset or otherwise emotional, we can produce half a cup of tears or more in just a few minutes. This essentially overloads the system, so that instead of draining through the puncta, tears roll down our cheeks. It is also why crying can make our nose run. As for why some people are known to cry over things like advertisements, and while others can't shed a tear at their grandmother's funeral, there's another mystery, though gender, culture, and personality are all likely factors. So that's all for this video on what makes us human beings. Thanks again for watching IFL Science, and we'll see you next time.